and he breaks their spirit and then they are able to follow his orders. And he also abducts girls. And when he abducts girls, he, many of those girls then become slaves to his, his, uh, his men. And so I have met with many of those girls and the situation they go through is horrible. So what is his, is he considered a revolutionary? It's, is he want a different kind of government? What, what is he fighting for? Why does he want this army? What is the... The so sad part is that he doesn't have anything. He's not a rebel. He's not fighting for freedom of Uganda. And to, you know, I don't know, and I don't know anybody else who knows that, what is he fighting for, except he has this very weird idea that he should be the leader of Uganda. I, cult, he's a cult. He's a, a, a cult. He's a person that's got a sort of a cult. And, you know, he was in northern Uganda. Then he was in Sudan. And now, with Sudan having improved uh, 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 situation in southern Sudan, he has now moved to the Democratic Republic of the Congo. And the last time when I was working on this issue, he had almost a thousand young children that he had abducted from all over, from Uganda, from Sudan, and the Democratic Republic. But now his force has gone down to 300 because a lot of those children have been brought, integrated back into society. They have been rescued. And so when people speak about intervention in Uganda to get Kony, it's wrong because he's not in Uganda. And for me, leave Uganda alone, not because I'm from Uganda, but the people in the north who are called the Acholi have suffered terrible degradation. They've lost everything. They're just now starting to integrate and settle, and they don't need any kind of intervention. The American government has sent 100 soldiers into Uganda to track down Kony. And Uganda can't do anything on its own because Kony is not in Uganda, he's in the Congo. And so it will have to be an international will to get hold of Kony. I guess I don't understand how, um, how, I mean, he obviously has a group of people that work with him and follow him. But I don't understand how, like, doesn't the present government have police, army, uh, that they could control it somehow? Well, they do. And they have <clears throat> many, many times I myself have been involved in this. Many, many times we have tried to negotiate for him to come out, and, we've, and then he slipped away. There was a time when I was involved in getting a satellite to him so that he could, he could communicate with us. And we did send him a, I used to work with Betty Bugombe, and I, uh, we did send him a satellite so we could communicate with him. And we are trying uh, to get him out. The, the challenge is it's not that easy to get hold of him. First of all, you have to imagine uh, that there is the, the, the terrain has got many, many forests, so it's easy to hide in the terrain. Mm -hmm. But the bigger thing for us is that it's not just Kony we would kill if we did a, 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 an a intervention. It would, us, it would be all the children around him. And so we have to find, we've always been trying to find a way to get him to come out and, and prevent the deaths of the children. So you mentioned Sudan, and I know um, around Uganda is Ethiopia, and then you mentioned the Congo, and there's been um, terrible things happening in the Congo. And I'm just wondering, like, how do all those outside um, influences and in countries sort of, how do they all mix together? And how does it, if there's killings going on sort of all in that region, like, what does that, I don't understand how those countries can be stable. Well, for Uganda, uh, sadly, what is happening is happening in northern Uganda. So southern Uganda is not affected by it. Uh, oh, okay. Sadly, I say it because, you know, it looks like, you know, no one's looking after the north. But now, at the present time, Kony is not even in Uganda. Okay. He is, from what we understand, he is in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. And, but there is more and more, and I'm pleased to, uh, to see that, uh, a will to really get to Kony. The U.S. has sent 100 soldiers. Canada is playing a very important role in finding ways to get Kony to come out. And uh, the, in the Democratic Republic of Congo, there is such a lot of conflict that it's hard to expect that government to go after Kony. But I know that President Museveni is really very much trying to find a way to catch Kony. Okay, so in, in, when you say the United States uh, sent in 100 soldiers, is that kind of as peacekeepers or to investigate, to hunt? For, for what I, uh, from what I understand, it's to hunt Kony. 
And can you imagine it needs 100 U.S. soldiers to try and find Kony? So it's a very complicated thing. It's not as simple as it is yes. just go out and get Kony. And as I told you that when I was involved in this, uh, our biggest preoccupation was that when we do an intervention to get Kony out, we should protect the children. How does our government make decisions on when forces should go in, peacekeeping forces should go in, and I'm particularly thinking about, um, well, how do we make our decisions in Canada on, on where our soldiers should go? Our decisions are very complicated because we have a lot of interests. You know, we belong to the Commonwealth, we belong to the Francophonie, we belong to the NATO. So if NATO makes a decision with our government's participation that they will go into Afghanistan, then obviously we will go to Afghanistan because that's a decision of the NATO. So it's not, it's a, um, it's a complicated decision, you know, and our government has sent, we have the best soldiers. I have worked with them for years. They are amazing. And I worked with them in southern Sudan. And, you know, what's, people tell me what's so special about our soldiers is that they fight for the job that they have been sent for and then in their spare time, they build orphanages, they build homes for children. We have the most amazing soldiers. As Canadians, I don't know if any of us know what amazing soldiers we have. So they work really, they, they do their volunteer work where they're in the area and also when they come, because we are a multicultural con uh, country, they bring those multicultural values to the country that they're going to. And I, I can tell you, having worked with our soldiers, they do an amazing job. But our challenge is we don't have enough soldiers. So the, the way the decisions, not in government, but from what I observe is definitely if NATO decides, then we would decide how many soldiers we're going to send to Afghanistan. But we also send soldiers, for example, to a few so, uh, soldiers to the Sudan. We Congo? send the Congo. We, oh, okay. I'm not that sure. That was the question. Yeah, that I'm not sure. Someone asked yeah. me why Afghanistan, why not the Congo, Congo. when so many well, lives are being taken. Absolutely. What's happening in the Congo is I, I do a lot of work with women, especially in the South Kivu area and the Bukavu area. Uh, and what's happening to the women there is just horrible. But the thing is that uh, NATO decided to to Afghanistan and we are part of NATO that's why we are in Afghanistan so far there hasn't been the will from any countries any any international interest the UN or NATO to go into the Congo so you not a I mean, do you have uh, contact with the gov various governments, like whether it's Uganda, you said you were in southern Sudan. Do you personally have contact with the government? Yes, I have contact with both northern and southern Sudanese government, with Kenyan government, Ugandan government, and Tanzanian government. Um, I, um, being an, of African origin myself, mm -hmm. I do have contacts with many governments. Uh, well, we are, you know, we are not in government now, so my contact is not as direct. But I have built relationships with many governments in Africa. And you spend time. Talk a bit about your time at the grassroots in the villages. Well, I, uh, I truly believe that uh, the Creator gave me the best job in this world to be a senator, and because I'm a senator, I'm able to go into a village, assess the situation, and often, I just go back and speak to the health officials in the Ugandan government and said, do you know this is happening? What we've been able to arrange is that to bring vaccination and immunization into the village from the Ugandan government. And so we go into a village, we assess it. Uh, mainly I work on malaria and polio and measles issues. And so mm -hmm. we assess it and then we, first thing we do is we immunize the children. Not me, I work with Canadian nurses. We have amazing, I'm just, I just have this much of a role. Our Canadian nurses do an amazing job. They do this as volunteers. They go in the village. Some, some nur nurses, such as Gail Fons and Deborah Lafebvre, uh, Canadian nurses, they stay in the villages for weeks and weeks. And they do this uh, you know, as volunteers. And they immunize, they clear the villages, they teach the people how to use the nets. And they try to, village by village, they improve the health of the villagers. Tell me about Evelyn Ubaka, if I said her last name right. E Evelyn Ubaka was a young girl uh, who was uh, abducted in, from Northern Gulu. She was, uh, what had happened is that her family th uh, had heard that there was going to be a, uh, a raid uh, near their house, so they went into the church. 
and sadly they walked into the church where the raid was taking place and Evelyn at the age of 10 was abducted by Coney's men and she you know, uh, was walked for, for days and days uh, she marched with the soldiers not fed really badly treated and for two years uh, uh, she herself was not a, a sex slave of any of the of the officers but she was uh, like a maid to one of the sex slaves she was looking after the baby and one day when they were running away from the Ugandan army a bomb hit near where she was and half her face was taken out and uh, um, how did you meet her? I met uh, Evelyn through a church group, and uh, then Evelyn came, came and stayed with me in Ottawa and here. And uh, um, Evelyn is just one of hundreds of girls that have had to face such sufferings. But to me, Evelyn is uh, now of always almost like my daughter. And uh, what is beautiful about Evelyn is, though, if you first look at her, you see she doesn't have a half a face. But when you come to know her, her laughter, her sense of humor, makes you get uh, gives you hope that she will recover but more importantly that she is just like any other teenager and she's like any of our children and the children in northern Uganda the children in the Congo really are the children of us all and we need to reach out you know it's not just about getting Kony out of course that is important but also to reach out to those children who had been abducted who have been freed who have a lot of psychological and physical needs so what's it like for you to have um, contact at, at the village level, actually meeting people and being part of their lives and then coming back here? And what would you like to sort of... For me, it is, uh, you know, I feel that I'm one of the privileged ones that got refuge in Canada. I'm very lucky that I was, uh, became, I was uh, given the chance to be, uh, live in this country and, and then to be able to become a senator. So I feel very much that I need to give back. And so I, I work in Uganda, but I also work in the East End here. I, I walk one night a month uh, at night to see a homeless situation. Uh, um, and I feel that, that kind of thing is important f uh, because we, we do a lot of our work in Ottawa to see what's happening in our own city. And there's a lot of things that need to be, especially with Aboriginal people, that need to be worked up out in our own city. As I was saying to you that um, I'm the chair of the Human Rights Committee, and we are going to be studying, we s just finished studying the issue of matrimonial rights on, on reserves, and now we are going to be studying the rights of Aboriginal people who live off reserves. I think it's really important, actually, and I'm glad this is, we're just at the end of the interview, but I'm really glad that you connect. I think sometimes people, it's easier to look at the trouble somewhere else and not so easy to even want to see it in our own front yards. Yeah, and you know, the one thing that really bothers me, and I have lots of, uh, this is where I get really upset. When there are problems in Africa, I can understand it because they don't have the organized government, they don't have the resources we do, but there is absolutely no reason for there to be homelessness in Canada. It's not acceptable. Nice to see you again, Mubina, and I, I'm so glad that we had a chance to talk about Uganda and some of the issues there because you straightened us out, for one thing. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Thank you.